Thank you. So I'm going to talk about how to count things really, really, really fast with roaring bitmaps. So uh, I'm a senior database consultant at Cybertech, and uh, I have 12 years of experience there with helping people do make Postgres do stuff that it usually doesn't like to do. So let's get right into it. So I'm going to start with uh, talking about a thing called faceting. Uh, because this is central to the counting thing that we are going to be doing here. That's the reason why we are counting. So for those of you that don't know, faceting uh, search is a way to do search where you, uh, in the, on the side of your search query, you show uh, additional attributes that you could filter by and how many results would be left after you filter by that result. So in this case, it's on the left there. You can see that if you filter by location, you can get uh, 20,000 entries from the United States, for example. So it seems like a simple problem. So we, here's a completely working implementation of faceting. You just select some attribute and the count star from a table to the group by add a where clause and you're done, right? And the attribute could be anything. It could be a category, could be a status, um, may maybe some date field. And um, uh, you would need to maybe, if you have an inter integer or me measurable field, you would bucket it up into s larger pieces so you can do a group by effectively because you don't want to have uh, thousands of facets. You would like to have something you can display, so it's usually not too big of a list there. But still there are so many different combinations that you cannot effectively pre-count pre the stuff. So you can filter on a category and then you need also on the date or filter on a category and the tag and there are so many combinations that effectively your cached result set would explode. But you also cannot uh, run, run the count every time because uh, some filters are not particularly selective. So if you are looking for, for example, English language documents, maybe half of those are English. So you need to scan half of your documents. But still, because we are using it as a na navigation aid for the user, it's not some reporting query. We are actually ha have somebody lo actively looking at that page. We need it to be reasonably fast. So that's uh, what our customer came uh, to us with. They had a use case where they had 100 million documents. They wanted to have some uh, reasonably accurate counts, so no false positives allowed. And they wanted to have a response time of below two seconds. And of course, they need to do this in Postgres because Postgres is cool. And also managing an, an Elasticsearch cluster for something like this, just for this feature, it seems like overkill. So for this talk, I'll use this uh, example document schema. It's not something real, but good enough for our purposes. We have a couple of date fields. We have a category, some type fields. And we have 100 million rows in there. And uh, we will be looking at the worst case scenario where we have a, a filter on something that is uh, most of the table. So we have a category 24 that is 60 million rows, or almost 61 million. So that's the one that we are going to be working with. So let's do a naive implementation of faceting. Because we are good developers, we will uh, do it in a single query and union all everything together so we don't do multiple database round trips. And the pattern here is quite simple. For each facet we want to have, we have a query that just selects uh, the count as we had on the previous slide there. So straightforward enough query and let's execute it. So the execution time for this query is 32 seconds, which uh, is far from interactive. The user will have gone away to get a coffee by, the, by then, so it's not exactly useful. But the good news is Postgres was able to use parallel query to make our sort of stuff faster. Otherwise, it would have taken even more time. So we are counting each one of those facets in parallel. So that's at least some good news. But each one of those is doing a sequential scan. So we are doing four scans over all of our 100 million documents. 
So maybe we can do something smarter and scan the documents table once. And for each row there, use a trick with a lateral query and the values clause to generate four different rows for each document's row. And then we just again group by and count. If we do this, uh, then uh, we get a slightly faster query. It's going to be 23 seconds. And the good news is that we are able to use a parallel sequential scan over the documents table. So we can use more cores to count more stuff faster. And each, each core will then aggregate uh, its own hash table and then we merge them together at the end. So maybe we can use more parallelism. By default, we used eight cores there, but the machine that I had had 24 virtual cores. So if we use that, we can get down to 17 seconds. But 17 seconds is still not interactive. And we don't want to use some 200 core monster. And we are only looking at four facets here, so it might get even worse if we have more. So let's uh, see. Uh, ca can we even do this in some reasonable way? So what is the core of the problem? Let's do some back of the envelope calculations to figure out what is possible and what is not possible. So for each row in our uh, search result and for each facet, we need to find out where is the counter for it and add one to it. And we need to do this one billion times because we have 100 million rows and 10 facets. And if uh, anything times one billion is a big number. So if you need to do a single memory access to find the counter, that's going to be 100 nanoseconds times one billion. That's uh, 100 seconds of CPU time. So if you can imagine, uh, the memory access is uh, the time it takes for light to get from here to basically other side of the room there. So randomized access is slow. We need to, if you need to walk to the other side of the room every time you need to access something, that, that's not going to be great. So what is fast? Well, CPUs are really good at uh, uh, doing bit arithmetic and the vectorized execution. So we are, can do wide values and uh, do simple arithmetic on it really, really fast. So let's take an example so of some quite recent CPUs. We have a few different instructions here that we could use that might be interesting for our use case. One of them is a vectorized AND operation where we take two bit vectors, we AND them together, and the result will have a one everywhere where both of those vectors had a one. And we can do two of those per cycle in recent CPUs. Similarly, we have a population count for 500-bit vectors where you can count the number of bits that are set to one. And we have an add instruction to add those uh, counts together. So you can imagine that we can quite easily combine those to figure out uh, how many bits match in two different bitmaps. And just to see some numbers, where would we end up, end up at, if we pipeline all of this, the CPU will be able to execute uh, them in a way that uh, every one to one and a half uh, cycles we will get a result back from it. Each one of those iterations will take multiple cycles, but uh, we can do multiple of them at the same time using pipelining. So in effect, we will be able to run at something like one trillion with a T, one trillion bits per second per core. So going back to our speed of light uh, uh, metaphor, that's going to be 0 0.3 millimeters per bit. So if you can imagine, we had to go uh, 30 meters versus 0.3 millimeters. That's quite a, quite a difference. So we can do quite a lot of uh, useless work when we are doing it so much faster. So let's convert our problem to bitmaps. Uh, assuming we have an integer ID field as we had, we can do a bitmap for each attribute and value combination. So for each attribute and value combination, uh, we have a bitmap where the positions 
that have a document corresponding uh, with their ID will have it set to one. So if you have a document with ID five that has those attributes and values, the bit number five in our bitmap will be one. That's simple enough. And then we just store it in a table so we can access it easily. And this is not something exactly novel. If some of you might know that this is called an inverted index in search engine field, and GIN is basically the same thing. Not with bitmaps, but, but the fact that we have a list of documents in an optimized format for each attribute value combination. So when we now need to calculate our facet counts, uh, we will first need to figure out what is uh, the matching set in our search result. So we either just run the search and uh, collect all of the IDs, which is again going to be a bit slow, but uh, usually those searches will be based on the facets. So the initial drill down will be based on the facets and then we can just reuse the bitmaps that we already calculated anyway. And then once we have the search result bitmap, we find for each facet the bitmap corresponding to it, we add them together. From there we get the result uh, where uh, there is a one for every uh, document that is both in the search result and that has that facet value. And then we just count how many bits are set and we are done. And we need to do that for every facet value. That's the hard part here. But uh, let's say we have about 10 facets. Uh, on average, we might have up to 1,000 values for each. That's going to be not a good case, but, but a rather worst case scenario for us. Uh, that would mean we have 1 trillion bits total. And as we saw, we can do that in one CPU second on one core. But the trouble is uh, that one trillion bits is 125 gigabytes. So we need to store that 125 gigabytes in memory somehow. And memory bandwidth is also going to be a problem because uh, typical CPUs get about 10-ish gigabytes per second per core. So how do we get around it? The good news is that uh, 99.9% .9 of those 1 trillion bits are going to be zero. So some things are very popular, other things less so. So in some cases we have um, many ones in our bitmap, but in other cases we have uh, quite a lot of zeros. So we need to have uh, some storage approach that handles both the popular case and the rare case. And that's where roaring bitmaps comes in. So this, it's a fast implementation of compressed integer sets. Uh, the compressed integer set just means that uh, we have a set of numbers and we somehow store it in a compressed format. And fast implementation of X is, uh, if you know Daniel Lemire, that's basically what he does. It's fast implementation of any random thing using simd accelerated code. So it's a really nice data structure. And reasonably new as data structures go. So not like a linked list or a hash table, but 2017. So a roaring bitmap is actually a quite simple data structure. It's a two level tree basically. And uh, we store in it 32 bit integers. And we split the integer into two parts. The low part, which is the numbers at the end, and the high part, the numbers at the beginning. And uh, we first take the fir uh, high part and uh, create a sorted list of all of the different high words that are present in our uh, data set. So that's the first level. And for each one of those, we have a pointer to a container, um, which can be of uh, one of several types. And that container will contain all of the numbers that have that specific high word, so those uh, beginning with the same numbers. The container types that we can use here, we have three 
typically we only use two. Uh, first one of them is an sorted array, and it's just no numbers in sorted order, two, uh, two bytes for each one of them, and it can be up to 4,000 entries. And you can uh, see that soon see why 4,000 is the limit. So the other one is the bitmap, because we can have up to uh, two to the power of 16 different values within one 16-bit uh, section. It, c it needs to be eight kilobytes in length. And you can see eight kilobytes is 4,000 two-byte entries. So once we hit 4,000 entries, it doesn't make any sense to have an array anymore. We convert it to a bitmap. And if our bitmap has less than 4,000 bits set, we can get, go back to an array. And uh, there is an optional compressed version that, that is run length encoded where we store pairs of uh, starting value and how many numbers are set to one. So if we have like 90% of the numbers are one, it might make sense to store it in a different way. And the good news is that it's dynamic uh, per, per container. So if we have a section of the ID space that contains lots of documents and another section that contains little, this uh, method is ad adaptive enough to cope with this also. And how do we actually run uh, operations on those uh, roaring bitmaps? The general pattern for that is uh, we take uh, the two containers or the two uh, bitmaps, we look at the container list, so which high words are set, and we pair them up. And then for each pair, uh, we can intersect uh, those or run the operation that we need to do on that pair. So, for example, if we are intersecting uh, roaring bitmap A with roaring bitmap B, we pair those up, and then we can have uh, multiple different options uh, for what the pair is. So, for example, if uh, either of them is empty, then the result is also empty because there is nothing set. But if they are uh, arrays, we have a special implementation for intersecting two sorted arrays of two byte numbers. If they are both bitmaps, Again, that same um, parallel land instruction and SIMD execution style will work there. And we have, for uh, intersecting an array and a bitmap, there's a branchless loop. So each one of them has some thought put into it. How do we do this to, in the fastest way possible? And this data structure is uh, so useful that uh, many different databases have already picked it up, including our Elasticsearch that we are trying to replace here, but also ClickHouse, Apache Hive, Pinot, all kinds of different things. And we also have it in Postgres. There is an extension called PG Roaring Bitmap, which uh, wraps this uh, Roaring Bitmap library written in C it's statically linked, so you only need this extension. You don't need to install anything else. Once you have the extension installed, it will work. And it introduces our roaring bitmap data type and uh, all kinds of different operations that we ru can run on them. And uh, you can get it from GitHub. Uh, not available on any of the cloud providers that are running their database as a service solutions, but you can, if you are able to run your database on your own, you can install it, or you can pester the cloud providers to actually validate this extension. So how do we use this in Postgres? Well, as always, we create our extension, and then we get this roaring bitmap uh, data type that we can use uh, as a column type, for example. So the example that we had, a facet uh, ID, facet value, and uh, bitmap. This is, this is the table that implements this. Straightforward enough. And once we have our roaring bitmap values, uh, or roaring bitmap columns, we can put values in them. So we construct our roaring bitmaps uh, either by using RB build function, which just takes an array and uh, converts it to this bitmap format. That is uh, easy enough, but uh, 
more commonly, we will actually want to use uh, an aggregate function called RB build aggregate that just uh, takes an integer result set and compresses it to a bitmap. So, for example, here's a way how we uh, generate uh, the bitmaps for a category facet. We just uh, RB build aggregate and group by, and that's the code needed to get our bitmaps for our category facet. And once we have those values, we can do different operations on them. We can combine two different bitmaps, so and, or, XOR, and not do what they say on the tin, so it works as you expect. You can get, get an intersection or a union. And you can also do similar things element-wise, so you can add one entry to a rolling bitmap, you can remove one entry from it, you can check if a value is set in a bitmap, or you can uh, get out the individual entries from the bitmap by either using the set function to RB iterate over a bitmap, so you can uh, uh, run a query over it, or a, a different option, you can convert it to an array, which is actually quite useful. So the useful part for us is the, that we can also count stuff. That is called RB cardinality, which uh, is a long mathematical word for how big is the set, how many items are in there. And we also have a bunch of operations that uh, do an operation and then calculate the cardinality, which avoids uh, some extra work that we would have to first materialize the result and then count it we can uh, just calculate the intersection and count it immediately, and we can avoid a bit of work there, so slightly faster. And we can also check if we are, our result is empty or not. And uh, those uh, previous ands and doors were running, uh, if you imagine your result set horizontally, you combine two values together horizontally, but you can also do it across rows using aggregate functions. So we can uh, or a result set together or and the result set together. And correspondingly, there's also a cardinality option uh, when we only care about the count. And the um, current limitation of this PG roaring bitmap is that only 32-bit integers are supported for now. But uh, we will get around this later. So how do we build our faceting stuff based on this code? Uh, first, we need a table to store our facets in. So here's, uh, here's a way to create the table for documents facets and immediately a query that populates it. We have our facet name, facet value, and the posting list. We use this uh, RB build aggregate that we saw earlier to build that posting list, and uh, to build this, we use that same uh, query that we saw earlier to just scan the documents and uh, generate our facet values. And as we saw, this runs, well, we need to do a bit of extra work to actually uh, aggregate stuff, but total execution time is 34 seconds, so it's quite fast to build, actually. And you might be worried that this extra, how much space do I need to reserve for this extra, extra table? So this uh, documents facets table is 200 megabytes for this 100 million entry table. So if you do a quick calculation in our head, that's approximately two bytes per row that we need to store. As a comparison, uh, the primary key that we added on the previous slide here uh, no, not, not that primary key, actually, the primary key of the documents table, so on the ID column, four-byte four uh, integer ID column uh, index, that's two gigabytes, so ten times bigger than this faceting helper data structure that we created. And just to see what are the different posting list sizes that we created, uh, we have five different facets here, uh, 
typically uh, they are quite small, but some of them are up to 12 and a half megabytes, which is 100 million divided by eight, and some extra overhead. And yeah, the total size depends on how well uh, the bitmap compresses. So you can see we have two different uh, timestamp columns. Uh, we have this created column. I generated the data set in a way that this created is uh, highly correlated, like you would have for some timestamps. And the other one is finished time, which is not that well correlated. And you can see that the, the created uh, bitmap is uh, 26 kilobytes altogether, whereas if it's less correlated, it's three megabytes. And for something that is uh, random, the, like the type field, that's uh, 84 megabytes together, just for eight different entries. So each, each one of them is gonna be 12 megabytes, almost. So how do we use this uh, helper table to get our facets? And query is uh, reasonably simple. We first need to do our search. This is the lookup part. We select from our facets table uh, the posting list where the category ID is uh, 24. And then we join the lookup uh, with our facets table again. And uh, now we look for everything that isn't the category ID. And uh, for each uh, facet uh, name and value, we will calculate the AND cardinality. So we intersect the posting list of our lookup and the posting list of the facet and uh, count how many results are in that intersection. And we can do this in one second. So if you look at the explain plan here, where is this one second going? Well, this one second is actually within the nested loop at the top, everything else is fast. So finding the facets is quick and uh, sequential scanning the facets table is also quick because we have uh, like eight pages of it. But somehow the nested loop is accessing 575,000 buffers. That's four gigabytes for a 200 megabyte table. So what gives? So the reason is toast. Uh, so toast is the method that Postgres uses to store large values uh, in an out of line way because uh, Postgres uses eight kilobyte pages and we cannot fit our 12 megabyte bitmap onto an eight kilobyte page. So we need to chunk it up into small pieces and uh, then store it in a secondary table. And this table has this uh, chunk ID, chunk sequence number and the uh, data columns and the primary key on the OID integer. Simple enough scheme. And every time we need to access a toasted value, this table is queried. And the trouble is that Postgres is not particularly smart on the planner side. When do we want to actually detoast this stuff? This is done basically when the value is accessed and uh, it's not cached commonly. And we don't actually have very much control over when do we want to detoast. So when we were running this query earlier here, let's go back to the query. So in our lookup table, this posting list is a 12 megabyte value. And every time uh, we run this RB and cardinality function, so for each row in our assets table, we detoast that 12 megabyte value once. And that's where, where our, most of our time goes. But we can do slightly better. We can force the planner uh, to detoast early using two tricks. Uh, first, we want, uh, want it to happen within this uh, first uh, width section, so we add an offset zero. Alternatively, you can use uh, as materialized. That's also another option where you can force something to happen early. And the other thing is that we want the detoast to happen within that query. So uh, 
I added a no operation, so there's a lift shift by zero operation added to this posting list. The, this will uh, do nothing, but uh, uh, but it forces the value to be recalculated, and uh, then we are sto storing this uh, value already in uh, in memory, and we don't need to detoast it again. And uh, this will um, make things remarkably faster. So now we are down to 80 milliseconds, which coming down from 30 seconds is actually uh, quite usable already. In theory, we could do other stuff also to make this detoasting stuff faster. So uh, on tables, we can set this toast tuple target value to say that uh, if at all possible, try to fit the value on our page. So if you don't have to move it out of line, try to store it on, on the page. Uh, by default, that value is, I think, 2,000 bytes or there, thereabouts. But uh, we can raise it to 8 kilobytes. So we store as much as possible of those bitmaps immediately on the table row so we don't do, have to do an extra lookup. We can also use faster compression. So toast values are compressed using uh, PGLZ. And that uh, compression algorithm is quite old and slow. And uh, we have now LZ4 available for toast compression. So we can either set the compression for that column to be LZ4, or even better, there is no point in using PGLZ anywhere. So just uh, reconfigure Postgres to use default toast compression LZ4 everywhere. And for the posting list, we actually don't really care about that compression anyway. So it might be even better to just uh, disable compression by setting storage to be external on the column. But after running a few experiments, it turns out that um, there is no major impact. There is a few percent here, a few percent there, but no major impact. So I, it doesn't really matter that much, at least in this use case. Might might matter in uh, different kinds of data distributions. But what does matter is uh, write amplification. So. Our documents table uh, usually is not stable. We will have new stuff coming in, maybe old stuff getting deleted, uh, maybe some updates happening. And we need to update our uh, faceting table also. So if we do this every time we run an insert or an update, that's going to be terribly slow because uh, each insert will need to do this uh, 12 megabytes by the number of facets updates, so maybe 100 megabytes of data needs to be rewritten on every insert. And updates will be double because we need to also delete that old value. So that's not going to be great. But what we can do is uh, use partitioning kind of uh, solution. So we chunk up the ID space into smaller pieces and uh, then we can only need to update those pieces that have changed. And ideally, our documents table is, uh, has a sequential ID field that is uh, only added to the end. So we only rarely need to modify the older chunks. We only need to update the latest one. And we don't want to keep the chunks big enough so that uh, we are still efficient, but small enough so uh, the updates are cheaper. So one example would be to partition it by just shifting the ID value right by 20 bits. That's approximately 1 million entries. And then we get 100 kilobyte bitmaps up to, which is already reasonably sized to update. And um, this makes things a bit more complicated, but not that much. We just uh, need to add a join on our chunk ID to our query, and we also need to sum up all of the results. And uh, interestingly, it doesn't make things slower, but uh, actually it uh, has a 10% performance improvement over not chunking things. 
So just as a reference, uh, what value to pick for the chunk size? I ran an experiment for uh, from 16 bits up to 27 bits, which basically is no chunking, and you get most of the benefit at somewhere around uh, 20 bits. Even 19 will be fine. But still, 100 kilobytes on every insert is uh, still overhead, so we can uh, further reduce the overhead by storing our updates in a delta table. So for those of you that don't know delta tables, uh, it's a way to quickly update counts without modifying the original row. So for each uh, ID facet, facet uh, and value pair, and for each document ID, uh, we store a row that uh, says, the, have we one more or one less? So this delta table will, uh, delta column will be one if we added a posting with this ID, and it will be minus one if we re removed it. And uh, we're using this uh, integer column uh, because we can then use uh, an insert on conflict to quickly update it. So if we do an insert, we have a trigger on our table, and that runs for each facet this query where we uh, insert into this uh, delta table the ID that we inserted and the plus one for each facet. And we, uh, we also have this own conflict handler to uh, add it in. So in case we deleted it earlier, uh, we can then add it back in and this uh, re negates this delete. And then periodically we will need to just uh, bring it back together and merge it into our facets table to make things uh, so that the delta table doesn't grow uh, too much. So for, for example, here's a way to do this using a merge command will be reasonably fast, so you can run it maybe even once a minute, easily. Just some other th stuff that you can do with faceting. So the things that we were looking at uh, had uh, one value uh, for each row, but sometimes you want to have more than one, so you can have tags, for example. So we have uh, seven different tags for each document, and you will have seven different facet values coming out. And there is no special thing needed to handle this. We just uh, generate the facet name and value pair for each value we have in there. Just makes the queries slightly bigger because it, we cannot use that values clause as easily anymore. We need to do an actual select. And we can uh, package all of this uh, stuff up. I created an extension called PG Faceting, uh, available on our GitHub. Uh, this work was uh, sponsored by Xenit, and uh, this implementation does all of the stuff that I discussed here, the chunking, the delta tables, the automatic trigger generation, uh, and packages it up uh, in a function where you can add faceting to a table. We add it to the do documents. We specify what is the key column. Uh, we want to have deltas available, and we specify what columns we want to facet on, and we have uh, some different options. For example, for the dates, we don't want to have each date to be a separate value, but we truncate it to a month value. Or for the size one, we bucket it to a list of different buckets. And we can also do generate some search queries. So we specify that we have some filters, and it, that will output all of the facets needed. And uh, the merge command that I showed you, that's packaged up in a run maintenance command that you can put into a cron job and run to get those deltas merged in periodically. Uh, 
and it's, we're going to be improving it uh, a bit soon, add, add some maintenance uh, stuff, maybe a better interface for uh, generating those search queries. We need to figure out what the use cases are and what does the API need to look like. Um, right now we are not joining in the deltas when we are searching uh, from the searching for facets, but actually that's reasonably easy to do. We just didn't have time to implement it yet. So we can have up-to-date uh, results available for every query. And may maybe you also want to handle uh, use cases where you have uh, maybe a million different values, but uh, maybe 10 of them are popular. So some way to throw away the stuff that is unpopular and handle it in a different manner. And uh, what, what right now doesn't work well and uh, will not ever work well with this method is uh, if we would have sparse values. So for example, if you wanted to do, I don't know, snowflake IDs, for example, this is going to, going to be terrible because uh, this whole bitmap compression thing relies on the fact that uh, if you have lots of, uh, lots of values, they are going to be close by and we can only use one bit per value. But this uh, is not true when our ID space is uh, sparse, that we have lots of unused values in between that are never going to be one. And in that case, just a simple integer array is going to be much faster than what we're doing here. And uh, just to discuss on some other stuff that you might want to do with roaring bitmaps. It's not only for faceting, uh, anywhere where you would have a set of integers that you need to intersect and union and do, it's uh, useful. So uh, I did a, an example on a graph algorithm where we, if we number the nodes with integer IDs, uh, we can store for each node the incoming or outgoing edges as a roaring bitmap. So the table would be node ID and out edges a bitmap, in, in edges a bitmap. And then uh, we can do, uh, for example, shortest path calculation. I'm not going to expect you to be able to understand this algorithm this quickly, but essentially what we could do is we just start from uh, one end and the other end, we, we find what is the set of nodes reachable by taking one step from each end. And we do, uh, repeat this until uh, we find uh, some node that is in both sets. So if we are coming in from two ends, if we find one node that is in, uh, reachable from both sides, we know that we have a shortest path. So that's a breadth first search over a graph. Uh, reasonably efficient implementation fits on one slide. And uh, here's the benchmark. I took the largest uh, open uh, graph data set that I could find with quick Googling, which is a live journal data set that has 4.8 million nodes, uh, 69 million edges. I tried to do uh, just generate random ID pairs and uh, find the shortest path between them. And then plotting this out uh, for the distance between the two nodes, uh, average search times about six milliseconds. Worst case is below 100 milliseconds. So we can do pretty quick graph queries also in Postgres with this. And that's all. We have a few minutes for questions. So. Hi, great talk. Um, just a question about the last slide, the graph queries. Did you benchmark it against not using roaring bitmaps? And how long would that take? Uh, I didn't uh, take that time. Uh, right, there's right. a thread on hackers in September by Joel Jacobson that did some deeper investigation on that.
Uh, thank you. Uh, just a question. Why not to store simple counts instead of the bitmaps in the table? Uh, the reason why we cannot store counts is uh, because we want to filter by some category ID or some condition, and we would, the count depends on that uh, filter. So, for example, uh, we cannot and we cannot scale that count because uh, if our language is French, we are not going to have that many documents on Bratwurst, for example. So, thank you. Okay, so I assume that this library uses uh, some SIMD instructions, so AVX uh, 2, AVX 512, or something like this. Yeah. So uh, it requires some low level, uh, some lowest CPU with those features, and does it work for ARM, for example? So if I want to run on some cheaper instance with ARM architecture? The answer is yes, it uses all kinds of uh, instructions, and it has multiple implementations for each instruction level, and it dynamically chooses at runtime, hmm. what is available. Okay, thanks. You mentioned there's limitation of the integer, 32 bits. Yeah. Is there any progress in 64? Uh, I don't know, but uh, I forgot to mention it when we were doing this chunking thing. Where was that? Anyway, if we... If we uh, throw away uh, the first, uh, if we put the first uh, bits of the integer into the chunk ID, and we only use the 20 bits of the ID value, we can store it as an integer four anyway. So we don't actually have to care about how, how many bits are preceding it. Uh, I wanted to ask if this uh, method can speed, uh, uh, speed up also some window functions, you know, because you showed some counts, but mm -hmm. if uh, there would be a uh, need to find like newest document in the some category or biggest document in some category, uh, would this method be also usable? Yes, I think so. There is a maximum uh, operation, for example, available that you can find. But it's hard to tell without the exact use case. Does it work for that specific one or not? So. Um, can I ask uh, the RB function functions? It's part from some extensions or uh, Roaring Bitmap extension. Yes. Okay. So PG Roaring Bitmap. Thank you. Okay. I will be uploading the slides later. You can get the link from the slides. Okay, I guess there are no more questions. Thanks for tuning in.